Okay, so I think next is uh, spiritual gifts. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the disagreements on this perspective. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, all right, so uh, I know Derek sort of broke this down when he taught on spiritual gifts a few years ago. Um, you might say there's, uh, I can think of three, maybe four. Um, you might say there's classical Pentecostalism, which has a very specific set of doctrines surrounding spiritual gifts. Basically, they will say that uh, you're saved, <clears throat> and then as a secondary experience, eventually you're prayed over or something. Uh, you know, I grew up in this uh, Assembly of God teaches this uh, generally as systematic theology that you're prayed for, and then you, and then after you're saved, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the first evidence of being baptized in the Spirit is that you speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now there's super extreme, you know, hyper charismatic circles that will say you have to speak in tongues to be saved, but that's not classical Pentecostalism. Some think it is. It's not. Um, but they will say you can be saved without being baptized in the Spirit. Okay, so there's a two-stage sta two receiving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, and then you know God might give you new gifts or something as you're as you continue. Uh, okay, so that's classical Pentecostalism. Then you might say I think I heard it described as okay. I'm going to name four perspectives. Um, sort of below that, you might say there's evangelical charismatic teaching. Uh, which I'd say X29 falls more into this category, is that um, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit when you're saved. You receive all of the Holy Spirit. It's not split up into two parts. And at that moment, you receive at least one spiritual gift. It might be tongues, might not be. Um, <clears throat> and then you might receive more gifts later. Uh, but basically all the supernatural or you know spiritual gifts listed in a place like 1 Corinthians 12, which we'll talk about, are still operative today. Okay. Uh, okay, and after that, you might say there's open but cautious is a perspective, uh, where there's sort of an openness to the idea that certain supernatural gifts are around for today, but people don't really pursue them. It's like, don't go crazy, sort of don't risk it, you know, sort of stay, keep your distance, but if God does something, I'm not going to be totally <laughs> offended by it. Um, and then there's cessationism. It basically teaches that the supernatural or revelatory gifts, as they're called, like prophecy, tongues, um, and uh, sort of someone walking consistently in a miraculous, like, healing gift or something like that, uh, died off with the apostles. There was a purpose for it in the apostolic age, and it died off uh, with them, and it's not for today anymore. Um, so I, some cessationists will say, uh, you know, miracles can still happen under God's sovereign plan. If you pray for someone, they might be healed. It might happen. But... Uh, it's not, it's not a given, it's not like, a, well, even I would differentiate from some charismatic ways of saying, of talking about the gift of healing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but basically, they will say that the idea of someone like walking and like giving a word from the Lord, a prophecy, speaking in tongues, that the purpose and time for that is passed, particularly because the canon is closed. The biggest argument is, okay, uh, generally they'll make is, Scripture is the word of God, and it's perfect. And God doesn't give anything imperfect. So in a charismatic will usually say, if you receive a prophecy, if it's from God, it should be perfect. But a charismatic will say, uh, I mean, a charismatic will say it's, it's, it has to be tested because, you know, you might distort it. And it should be tested by Scripture. Scripture is the highest authority. Mm -hmm. And so the cessationists will respond and say, <clears throat> how can you say that if God gives it, it's perfect? And why don't we open our Bibles again and write it if it's actually a prophecy from God? So... Clearly, you know, there's not this middle ground. There can't be this middle ground of it's from God, but also should be tested because the canon's closed. Okay, so prophecy is done away with. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if I should wait. I guess, I guess I'll give my basic response to how I think about that. Um, again, with, this, with Acts 29, we do believe in the continuation of uh, revelatory gifts, prophecy. Um, I think you, you do see in Acts, uh, like the four sisters... Uh, who were prophets, nothing they said was canonized. But they had a reputation for being prophetesses without having biblical things they said. You know. um, so clearly to say something prophetic does not mean you're writing scripture. Um, and they were under the apostles' authority. Um, so basically what I would say is God's not giving something imperfect if he gives prophecy today, but he doesn't preserve it from being distorted apart from being tested by scripture. Okay, <clears throat> um, so if it's used rightly, um, 
if you walk in a prophetic gift, uh, it should drive you to be more dependent on Scripture to be accountable. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so it is functional today, but God doesn't preserve it from you screwing it up when it goes from your head to your mouth. You get it? Okay. So in order to avoid that, we need to be more biblically rooted. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go through some of the spiritual gifts here, give biblical examples of them. <coughs> this will be, I think, the last section. Okay, so spiritual gifts are when God, by his spirit, grants abilities to individuals in the church for the edification of the body. <clears throat> All right. Uh, spiritual gifts are described a few times in the New Testament. Okay. So we're going to go through uh, a portion from 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, again, there's other gifts mentioned in other lists. We're just going to talk about these for now. Um, oops. Nope, go back. Got to actually look at them. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so now there are, ver very, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, again, I would say to cessationists, notice this is addressed to the general church population. Would you give me water? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, just getting over a cold. <clears throat> Okay, this is, this is not talking about, hope. you better hope there's apostles among you who walk in these gifts that are going to cease when they die. This is talking to people walking just in the local church, you know, general people like you and me. Okay, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. <clears throat> Next, uh, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, oh, thank you, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he will. Okay, and so I just at the beginning they're sort of distanced from cessationists and said I would say this is addressed to the general church population without an expiration date. Um, but at the end here it says, "Who apportions to each individually as he will," which I want to emphasize sort of to distance from the classical Pente Pentecostal side because there's often this theology that says if you come to the altar I'm going to pray for you you will receive this gift right now if you'll believe for it. But it says that God gives it as He will. Okay, so there's a continuation of the gifts, but they are under God's sovereign plan in giving them. Does he mean that all those gifts should appear in the church? Uh, well, it's talking about all of them in the context of the church. So I mean, I mean, God assembles the believers. Yeah. So he would assemble the gifts. Yeah. Yeah, and it's talking... Is that, a, is that a logical conclusion? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. But is there something further, though, you're concluding from that? I mean... Other than every church then is equipped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's talking about basically his big. Uh, he's just talked, I think, in the previous chapters about a lot of division, things like that. So, big emphasis he's bringing when he talks about this way. He's always saying, by the one spirit, by the one spirit, by the one spirit. Mm -hmm. Basically, not to despise another gift, but to walk in unity because each one is, is necessary. Okay. For the in the body. Yep. For the common good, as he said. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> so, I think, okay, there are nine gifts mentioned in this particular list. We'll go over them real quick before we finish up. Okay, so wisdom is one. I won't dig into the def biblical definition too much other than to say it. Gener it probably means um, a supernatural, supernatural spirit-given you know, ability to speak into someone's life and give them guidance they would not have thought of themselves. Okay. So, you know, proverb-like wisdom at the right time. Um, knowledge. Okay. When God gives information supernaturally that an individual could not have otherwise. This is interesting. Um, I'll give a biblical example, but a lot of cessationists really love Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, uh, the, the guy in London who was a Baptist. 
every Reformed person's favorite Calvinist preacher. Um, and, of course, he was a cessationist, right? They assume, maybe he claimed to be, but there's stories written in his biography, <clears throat> for example, when he was in a congregation and he looked, pointed to a man and said, the gloves in your pocket aren't paid for. You stole them. And the man, you know, Whoa. repented, and, you know, it was true. You know, And there was another one, like, this man over here, he stole some change from his register, you know, in the store that he owns. You know, and, of course, the man ends up repenting, you know, but things like that, you know, words of knowledge from a cessationist. It's, I find that hilarious. <laughs> um, so I, I think a lot of cessationists accidentally are charismatics, but they don't want to admit it. I saw, uh, I saw, a, um, I saw this interview between, uh, well, the uh, founder of our network, Mark Driscoll, before, I mean, there's been some controversy surrounding him lately, he's no longer part of the network, which, which is a little bit, a lot of bit, okay, um, but, okay, I, I, that aside, um, Sorry, I remember he, he, he's a, he's, you know, when he was, I mean, I guess he still is, you know, he's a continuationist, charismatic, yeah, in that regard, he was talking to Douglas Wilson in an interview, Douglas Wilson is a cessationist, Presbyterian, um, and they're going back and forth, uh, and, you know, Doug Wilson says, how can you, you know, have continuation of gifts and a closed canon, you know, and then Driscoll goes, well, how can you not? You know, they're going back and forth. And then Wilson eventually admits, he's like, there's this one time this woman uh, <laughs> was telling me about, uh, or what was it? She was, she was, you know, really rebelling against Christianity, and she, you know, I couldn't, nothing I said got through to her. And then one time I was like, he said he was like laying in bed or something, and he says, I was reading this passage talking about like sexual immorality, and I knew she was involved in sexual immorality. I don't know how I knew, I just knew it. So I brought it up and she repented. Um, and, uh, wow, and, then Dr- and Driscoll's like, oh, see, you're a closet charismatic. He's like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah, anyways, <laughs> I find that hilarious. But uh, Okay, so, yeah, that's, I'd say that would be a, an example of a gift of knowledge. You, you know something that you couldn't otherwise know. Is that also known as discernment? Yeah. yeah, it's that's mentioned separately in the list, although I'd say there's connection. Uh, I mean... I wouldn't say it's totally separated. Let me see here. <clears throat> um, okay, so here's an example from Scripture. But Peter said, this is Ananias and Sapphira, if you remember. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Right. In that account, there's no way... You know, Peter could have known that. It just came to mind. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the gift of faith. This is listed. Now, I think this is different from saving faith because it's, it's talking about an individual gift here that's separate from, you know, obviously everyone has the gift of saving faith if you're saved. I'd say this is talking about uh, <coughs> the assurance God gives that he will accomplish something in a specific instance. I think I've heard it, <coughs> I mean, Paul doesn't outline it that way in this passage, but I think you can, you do see this kind of thing operating in Scripture. This might be what he's talking about. It's probably coupled with a particular gift of healing or a miracle at a specific time. Okay. Um, I think next is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, healing. I heard Sam Storms, he's a X-29 guy, talk about this. He talked about it as, um, uh, well, the gift of healing. Often we, t- we think when we read it, that it's talking about a person walks around and has this gift of healing they carry around mm-hmm. with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like, uh, doctor's bag. Like, basically, <laughs> basically, if it operated the way they claimed it operated, they could go into hospital and empty it out, you know. Yeah. But I think in the grammar, he points out that it's gifts of healings. Mm-hmm. They're both plural. So it's probably talking about the event itself is the gift, not the thing the person carries. Mm-hmm. And so potentially anyone could operate in a gift of healing at a given time. You know, basically, we're asking. So it's, again, it's events God gives. There's God gave a gift of healing at this point. You know, I prayed for this person. He gave a gift for a healing at that point, and uh, I think it often it's coupled with the gift of faith. Because yeah. yeah. that's what, I, from what I've seen in my life, it, yeah. it, the reason that we tend to associate with it, it with an individual, but I think that's because it's those individuals who have the faith to know, you know, hey, this is going to happen. Right. I can feel God is here. He's going to heal this person. Right. I have the faith in that, so they pray and yeah. a miracle happens. 
Yeah, now again, there's extremes where people think you muster up faith in a sense, like if I can muster it and clench my and eyes and my sister, talk, and then I'll, that's going to make this gift happen. But I think both the faith, the powerful faith, and the healing are both gifts in that moment. Mm-hmm. And so God gives them when he wants, you know. Well, that uh, time when the woman with the blood flow touched Jesus' robe. Yeah. And he felt the power mm-hmm. leaving him. Yeah. And who touched my robe, he says. Yeah. And who touched her to have that kind yeah. of faith? Yeah. yeah, I think they were both gifts from God. Gifts from God. Um, okay, I think I also have. Uh, okay, so here's a here's an example of healing in Scripture uh, after Jesus. Okay, but Peter said, "I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk." And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, I think given the theology we've talked about, about, you know, God giving both faith and the miraculous event, I think God was, you know, communicating to Peter that's what was going to happen. But often, again, I see often in extreme, in more extreme, you know, charismatic circles where they think you can just muster a healing anytime you want. And you're basically bossing the Holy Spirit around. I don't think that's quite what this scripture is, is encouraging. <laughs> But, you know, basically they say, that's, that's how we're supposed to, Jesus said to heal the sick, that's how we do it. <laughs> you can go and command, the bolder you are, just go, and it's going to, you know, I think we should take risks, I think we should always pray for healing, but I think, uh, I do think that in specific instances, you know, God gives a supernatural faith, and uh, I don't think this is encouraging us to command, boss the, boss the Holy Spirit around any, any given instance, I don't, that's not... I don't think that's biblical. But well, that's really presuming. You mean God isn't subject to my will? Wow. <laughs> well. Presuming a position you don't have. Right. right. Well, it's presuming also that you can intervene in somebody's life mm-hmm. and change God's direction for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and these people die right. because that's God's mm-hmm. choice for that time and that mm-hmm. person. Yeah, I have heard, I have heard, oh, I'll get to you. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I have heard a, a particular preacher, you know, he argues that <clears throat> certain people die too early because wow. we're not exercising oh. our faith. Oh. Um, so that's how extreme it can get. It's oh. like David will write, you know, you've written my days for me before there was yet one of them, but then they'll contradict that and say, you know, you're not exercising your faith. People are going to die too early. <laughs> you know, you've got to rebuke this death. Uh-huh. And raise him from the dead. You know, Jesus healed every single person he saw, right? So why don't you? Well, which he didn't actually, no, but okay. <laughs> but you hear that kind of argumentation. Go ahead. What would you say to the people who do like who are really bold about things and they see like a thousand times more healing than us, like because they're mm-hmm. they're seeing results? Is it like mm-hmm. not real? Is it not from the Lord? Well, I'd say. I would say the more you ask, the more you will see. That is true. I think, I mean, it does say in Scripture you have not because you ask not. Um, but, and I think but often God allows you to be less prayerful to teach you things sometimes. I think, I think there, are certain, there are certain branches of the church that don't walk in these gifts because they don't think they're for today. And I think they are missing out that, on something that God would give them if they would you know, believe what he said. I think that's true. But again, he's permitting a wrong belief system for a reason, I think. Again, I don't think any of it's quite slapping his hand away or thwarting his purposes, ultimately. But, um, but I think, yeah, if you in, an, in a place where people are asking and praying, I think God's going to answer what's asked more. Okay. And I think... Um, and I we think, don't see that. Yeah, and I th- don't ask for it. Yeah, that's, Scripture says that, doesn't it? You were gonna say? I think there's a tendency... That whatever we're locked into ourselves, yeah. we tend to think everybody else should be able to do it or yeah. see the same importance to it that we do. Yeah. So this Very person's true. boldness might be the Holy Spirit's gifting. To right, them. gift of faith that we and just they talked want about. To encourage us to be like that too. Yeah. But the assumption is the Holy Spirit is going to give each and every gift to each and every person to mm-hmm. each to the same degree. Right. And I think the Scripture shows us that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Paul said in one place, do all speak in tongues rhetorically? Right. The answer is no. Right. Not everybody teaches, not everybody speaks in tongues. Mm-hmm. So, but I would say there's no church, there's no church or branch of churches that is excused from pursuing 
each gift within the body. I totally agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I think we want to affirm the person's boldness and yeah. gifting, yeah. but not feel like we have a duty to do the same thing. Right, right. Just like mm-hmm. Okay. So, anything else? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You could speak with uh, Derek about his father-in-law. That's is he, mm-hmm. that who he's writing yeah. The story Derek about? has talked often about his father-in-law, who's God has used it in used in healing like consistently. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. I'm just um, talking about like the church branches, which you know of, that yeah. ardently pursue miracles and hear all this ridiculous stuff. Yeah. And even if we did those things, I'm not sure we'd see the amount. Again, the same it's, pastor. It's more exaggerated. Yeah, the same pastor uh, that I just mentioned, who I won't name, who is again in a more extreme, charismatic church, um, I've heard him preach in sermons. Basically, don't talk about what's not happening. Um, you know, focus on what is happening. Um, and so, yeah, you, they shout loud the miracles God is doing, and they don't talk about when he does when it doesn't happen. And so, basically, you're going to hear about the success, and you're not going to hear about when God it's maybe. Important. Think I think it's important to be honest about both, you know. Um, you know, it's okay. It, 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 it's just, it, it has, I mean, I've, again, I, I've been in circles for a long time where, in the extremes, where it is very frowned upon to suggest it might not be God's will to do a miracle in this given instance. Um, very offensive, you don't say that. God would ne- God is always pursuing the good thing to happen and the devil is pursuing the bad thing to happen. It's like telling your kids yes all the time to everything. Yeah. And so, I mean, they won't go so far as to say this is your fault, you're sick because you don't have enough faith. They won't say that implication of what they're saying. I mean, I've, I've heard it get that bad a few times, but generally that's an implication they'll just leave unsaid, but they'll say the positive side, not the negative side. You see the point? It's just too bad you don't have enough faith for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and bang bang! You're one sick. Of the problem with all of this is the focus turns back to us. Right. The spirit is come to glorify Christ, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the manifestation of the gifts should be building up the church for the glory of Christ, not to turn us back to, do I have enough faith, or did I do mm-hmm. it right, or yeah. Because I can take implications pretty easy. I'll reach for them, mm-hmm. and I'll burden myself with them. Right. And, you know so. Yeah. Anything that is turning us back to ourselves is probably something we should look at. And yeah. Yeah. What was the passage where the apostles were trying to cast out? Was it a demon? I think. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they couldn't do it, and Jesus came along and essentially rebuked them because he's like, "You're not trying to do this." Yeah. Exactly. You're not trying to do this because you have faith in God or because you want to glorify Him. You're yeah. Doing it because you want to look like my apostles and look like you're. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think you're conflating two different. I know what you're talking about. I think, okay, yeah, I think in one of them, in one of them, he said this kind only comes out by prayer, um, which is very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm still sorting out what that means, um, but uh, you know, I think there is a po- certain spiritual power that does come with prayer and fasting, and you know, that that's true. Um, but then there's another passage that you're talking about where um, where they, they're celebrating their power to cast out demons. He says, "Don't don't rejoice that you have." authority over the demons rejoice that your names are written in heaven and so i think that does apply in that a lot of these more miracle seeking denominations are focusing on the miraculous they're not focusing on the gospel um so i would definitely apply that um okay so anything else there let's see here that was a gift of healing uh miracles okay obviously healing is a miracle here's the here's the bigger broader category this is interesting. Now, I, I think I've heard of things like this happening, like in Africa and certain mi- missions movements. I, I, you will find, I, from what I've heard, different stories, things like that. I mean, the supernatural seems to just be much more prevalent where the gospel is being pioneered in a new place. Um, okay, so uh, so I've heard of things like this. Generally, I always hear about healings, but I've also heard of weird stuff like this. Um, but it's other other supernatural things. Mm-hmm. That can happen. Um, I'll give an example uh, from Acts. Okay, but Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop 
making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what had occurred, for he was a... then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Notice all these so far are always always pointing to the gospel. As this happened, and then they believed, and then they believed, and then they believed. This is never pointing to a particular apostle or a particular prophet, a particular person. Um, it's always, you know, that's that's. If you want to exercise discernment, that's a good way to do it. What, what does this gift point to in the end? What what is talked about after it happens? Okay, <clears throat> next, uh, prophecy, okay, tongues used to be the more controversial gift, prophecy I'd say more, is more so these days, and uh, th- these things are debated, uh, one of the most outspoken cessationists today is John MacArthur, uh, he had a whole conference called Strange Fire, uh, you guys know the story in the Old Testament about the men who brought strange fire on the altar and were consumed by the Lord, mm-hmm. basically saying there's all these weird ways of worship going on today. It's strange fire before the Lord. And so he's arguing against, you know, charismatic gifts. So, <clears throat> just a little insight into the controversy of how it's going today. But, uh, you know, one of the big things they talk about is prophecy. Um, well, so, basically, basically what he's saying is that those who accept the gifts today and, and function in them and act <clears throat> in them or, in, you know, and God works through them, He's basically saying that they're outside of God's truth. Yeah. Well, and to an extent, I mean, it's interesting. He, I, I'd say when he's being nicer, he'll maybe differentiate. Uh, he basically will summarize and say, as a whole, the charismatic movement is damaging and should not be going on. But he has friends like John Piper, who's a continuationist. Uh, bit of a, he's more reserved in his charismatic leanings, but he is charismatic. Uh, and you know that they still are on relatively good terms, from what I can tell. But uh, <laughs> but he's he's not afraid to call him out, and he has. Um, and it can get heated, to be sure. Um, it's. Uh, I also think um, a lot of more uh, a lot of these movements they tend to almost approach universalism, where it's like you can worship God however you want. And yeah. I, I think yeah. he's also trying to take a stand against that. Yeah, yeah. I'd say, I mean, all every denomination has its... Its its convictions are going to... Whatever it emphasizes is going to have an extreme. And I'd say the charismatic movement's version of that can be subjectivism, as it's called. Uh, you know, very, uh, very much based on feelings rather than on the objective, you know, scripture, things like that. And so, in that sense, it's more... It might be more open to liberalism and things like that because liberalism is very much about subjective truth and things like that. So I've I've seen them intersect at that point when people aren't careful, but there's dangers in you know cessationism too, right? Like being not biblical. And, uh, just <laughs> 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 Anyways, had to say it. No. <clears throat> as long as you were filled with the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> um, Okay, uh, so prophecy, uh, similar to knowledge, the ability to speak out something that God has brought to mind concerning someone's life or future. Um, okay, so here's a, an example in Acts when Paul's about to travel, and a prophet said to him, okay, and again, this is not an apostle. Uh, um, now, this did end up in scripture, but this man had a reputation as a someone who prophesied, and pretty clear there are lots of things he probably said that are not in scripture, you know. There's this, clearly this non-apostolic ability in the New Testament to prophesy. That's what I want to emphasize, which I think is a good evidence of, you know, continuationism or charismatic thinking, as it's called. Okay, so while they were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. <clears throat> now, it's interesting. Uh, Sam Storms argues that if you look at the fulfillment of this later in Acts, some of the details are off. <clears throat> some of the things that uh, Agabus said were not quite not quite right. So he's arguing this is, it's not to say the scripture made a mistake, but it's reporting that Agabus made a mistake. 
And so it's showing here's a fallible prophet. It came to pass, but not quite exactly. Um, so there's there's fallible prof- prophecy for you right in Scripture, which is what we believe. Where did it go wrong? Because uh, well, th- he was. He, they didn't use his well, belt, but well, I, I'm trying to remember. I, I I can't remember where it was fulfilled. It was, it was did, a little bit later. He, he did get handed over. Yeah, he gets handed over, but I think like the exact people who handed him over was a little different, or or something like that. Okay, I mean, um, they didn't take him out of the temple and hand him over to the Romans. Right. It was so. yeah. Um, and so I mean, cessationists have a response to that, which I can't remember. Could go back and forth, but that's that's one argument that I've heard is there's an example in scripture of someone who's a prophet, but he's not, you know, stoned to death like in Old Testament standards for not being quite perfect in his prophecy. Okay. Um, again, that's not that's not an example of scripture being in error. It's just scripture's reporting a fallible person. Uh, okay. The scripture does quite a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the point. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'd have to look at it again and see whether it, there's really details off. But again, that's an that's an inter- way, that's an the, inter- point inter- <laughs> the point is made. It's an interesting argument I, I heard. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Okay, so distinguishing between spirits, discernment. So uh, something uh, Marlena mentioned here. Um, okay, so the ability to tell whether a spirit uh, or teaching is from God or not. Okay, now I, it's interesting. I I wonder whether Paul's only talking about this supernatural, like, just subjective sense, or if he's also talking about, uh, you know, the ability to, you know, have knowledge to discern after studying, whether you have the ability, like, a spiritual ability to gain knowledge like that. Um, I think this is, it does seem primarily to be talking about, like, if a spiritual manifestation happens in the church, you're able to discern whether it's from God. That seems to be what it's mainly talking about. That example that you used earlier, yeah. Elimus. Yeah. And Paul's response to him, uh-huh. you know, calling him son of the devil. Right. You know, right. there's a discernment in Paul's case. Yeah, you definitely see that uh, in Acts, in a few examples. Like, someone seems to be saying something almost godly, but then he says, no, you shut up. You're <laughs> not of the Lord. You know, shut up's a mild thing, example of what they said. So but, would the Bereans be discerners? Yeah. I'd say, but again, that's more of a academic discernment, right. I'd right. say. I, I wonder if that's what he's talking about here. I don't know. I'm not it sure. Is. It's hard I to say. Understand. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I'd like to think so because I mean, I, I'd like to think I have that gift, but but this is more a supernatural. You know, go ahead. How does it fit in? Um, my sheep hear my voice. Mm-hmm. How does that fit in? Well, I'd say that's almost that's almost uh, that's almost like a general giving of discernment, isn't it, to the whole church? That's talking about every believer. If you're a believer, you hear the voice of the Lord when it's spoken. Mm-hmm. You know, and so you might say there's a spirit. There's a general discernment you have just because you're saved. Uh, but this this seems to be more of an extra measure of it, you know. Like this is a specific thing you are you are gifted in, you know. Um, you know, I don't know if it quite falls under this, but something my father has always had, and I think it's a gift from God, is that when somebody is taking action, they yep. they claim to be you know for a certain purpose, especially when they they claim to be doing it for some godly purpose. Mm-hmm. He can almost always tell just from listening to what they said about what they want to do. Yeah. Whether or not they're doing it because they want to honor God or because they want to do, they're doing it for some other reason. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what this falls under. Yeah, I um, think it might. And it's, again, it's not so much because he searched the scriptures like it talks about the Bereans doing to find out if it's, you know, it lines up with God's word. He just kind of almost has this spiritual sense that yeah. they're doing it to honor God or they're doing it to honor themselves. Yeah. That's why I asked about the difference between if, it, if knowledge and discernment are the same, mm-hmm. because there's often times where I think that mm-hmm. I see more visible. Mm-hmm. I, I guess uh, this is just me, but kind of the way I divide those out is knowledge is like you don't know how, but you know some yeah, particular portion of their life. Like, you know, when Jesus was at the well and he said, discernment. Yeah, that's why I was like, Right, and I think mm-hmm. discernment is knowing about why they're doing something. Mm-hmm. Um, are they doing this because, you know, because it might, it might be a good thing that they're doing, right. but they could be doing it but for bad purposes. Yeah, Jesus yeah, was... Bad reason, sorry. Yeah, Jesus was very good at that, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. He managed to yeah. exhibit all the gifts perfectly. Yeah. Um... Okay, let me see. I predicted right earlier today we're going way past, but that's cool. <laughs> I knew this was my biggest PowerPoint, so. Okay, <clears throat> we're almost done, though. I think there's a couple more. Okay, so, uh, yeah, here's uh, John talking about it. Uh, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits 
to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. I think this would apply particularly if there's a prophet, mm -hmm. a prophetic person operating in your church. You need to be able to listen and, and know, you know, what, where it's coming from. Does it line up with scripture? This is, uh, again, that's a very difficult thing to have, and often when, again, I've seen it in extreme, where things get extreme in certain circles, um, prophecy is sought after so highly that it's put above understanding of scripture and so prophets never are corrected you know and eventually the pro the prophets or the prophetic people become the dominant force in the church not the not the elders who are biblically informed um so that's again a p potential danger well i mean you see people predicting the end of the world and yeah some people go as far as selling all their earthly possessions yeah <laughs> what's the guy's name i can't think of it you know, the guy who was always predicting him, he's, he's dead now. But <laughs> he did it like three different times. Yeah. Harold Camping. Harold Camping. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Harold. James White debated him. I couldn't even listen to the whole thing. The man would just... Oh, he says all Oh, couldn't even... Anyways. <laughs> okay, so tongues. This is what probably weirds out cessationists the most. Um, it weirds me out, my mom. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Okay, so I'd say re, if you give a good reading to, I think I, I think I open up to chapter fourteen. Uh, if you give a good reading to chapter fourteen, it talks about the purpose and nature of tongues. But in summary, it's the ability to speak or pray in a supernaturally given language for spiritual edification. Okay. <clears throat> I think is the passage next. Yeah, okay. So I think I have, uh, yeah, I have a few different passages like spread out from chapter 14 sort of pushed, pushed together to get the main points I want to draw out. Um, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Okay. Now the thing is he's talking about speaking uh, intelligibly uh, and it's edification of the body versus speaking in tongues edifying yourself. And so he's sort of saying in the corporate gathering, speak in English. <laughs> Um, and so if you, if you speak in tongues, you know, do it quietly to yourself unless there's an interpretation. Okay. So, uh, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So a lot of cessationists will either say it's not for today or they'll redefine it. And this is talking about foreign languages, but it does seem to say that even the speaker's mind is unfruitful. Okay. So y your mind is not being edified. Your spirit is, you don't understand what you're saying is what it seems to be saying there. Okay. Which is why I would say this is. This is what charismatics think it is. That's what I'm saying. Okay, um, so what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. And then later on in the passage he says, But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them, people who speak in tongues, keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Okay, so there's the guidelines for tongues. Uh, it says, if there is no one to interpret. <sighs> I'm wondering if I should say this here. Um, me and Derek went back and forth on this. He has a slightly different take on what interpretation is. Uh, I'll let you take, get his take if you want to form your opinion. But he, he experienced something I, I'd say was supernatural in, in Africa where uh, a kid who didn't speak English spoke in English, mm. uh, praising God, and he interpreted to the congregation in uh, Swahili, I think. Um, and so basically that's his understanding of what's being talked about here is um, basically... But from what I can tell, he would therefore believe that the interpretation is not the supernatural gift. It's just something, hope someone's there to do it. But here, uh, in my opinion, I think what it's saying is both, like, I'd say that was a legitimate miracle that happened, but I think here it's talking about both the supernatural tongue and the interpretation are both supernatural gifts. Um, he would, I think, I mean, we, we talked about writing papers back and forth, breaking down the scripture on it, but anyway... Maybe he'll finish it and I'll send it both papers to you guys. But uh, from what I can tell, you know, I won't force you to disagree with Derek on anything, but I, I think it's saying both the interpretation and the tongue are supernatural gifts in this context. Yeah, so, but you mentioned somebody speaking in a foreign tongue, not yeah. I think what that would saying. be. I think that would be an example of what happened in Acts during Pentecost. Right. And yeah. So does that so fall I'd say, under this as well? Yeah. Or is it I think, like two subsets? I think Derek would say they're both the same. Mm -hmm. Um... X2 in this, I think this is different because it does seem to put them both in a different category. Uh, but I don't want to cause division or anything, but that's just something we, that's something we went back and forth about. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. But, um, because the, the other thing, you know, see, you could also file this under a miracle, so it, it's not yeah. a big deal. But like, yeah. I have heard stories of 
um, like a while back, uh, I read the story of a missionary couple who were in Russia and they didn't speak the uh, local dialect, which was somewhat different from standard Russian, and, but they knew there was somebody from the local area that needed support, so they went to see them and the wife was surprised to find that she spoke English, so they talked for like an hour and then she left with her husband and she's like, said to her husband, well, if the person was speaking English, you never said anything the entire time, why didn't she say anything? And he said, you were talking in Russian the whole time. <laughs> and so, oh, wow. um, yeah. I, I yeah. Can, that could be a miracle. But it seems like sometimes people, the gift of tongues means talking in yeah. languages, other human languages, and sometimes it means talking in a spiritual language. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, like in chapter 13, just before this, between 12 and 14, it says, uh, if, I speak with if I speak tongues of men and angels, so whether he's just speaking, exaggerating, or whether he's talking about this very thing, it's not totally clear. But it's, it's hard, because nowhere in the New Testament is it systematized. You know, you, you see people supernaturally speaking in different languages, I think, in Acts 2. Here it seems to be talking about, like, spiritual languages no one understands without a supernatural interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't say what all the categories are explicitly. And so it takes some interpretation. Um, now, a cessationist, I think, would go further. I think James White argued against this by going further in Chapter 14. It talks about tongues being a sign for unbelievers mm -hmm. um, and they'll basically say well this was during when the Jews were being judged or something like that and so but because a certain period of time is over now tongues aren't necessary but it seems there's more than one purpose of tongues being talked about here like self edification is definitely something I, th I think I see here in chapter 14 so I don't think all the purposes for it have ceased so that would be my response to that um, anyways anything so else? All this to say if you do start speaking in a way that you can't understand, don't think you're demonically possessed. Right. Don't listen to John MacArthur <laughs> trying to scare you. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so, in the charismatic circles, I've had people say to me, well, you just need to practice and you'll be able yeah. to do it. Yeah, there but is really a general... If it's, if it's supernatural, there isn't any practice involved in it. Yeah, I mean, I've experienced it. I do speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's very hard to explain. It's it's voluntary, but it's yeah. It, it, practicing is you don't really practice it. It's hard to explain it. Uh, but yeah, again, because of what I pointed out in chapter twelve, I think it is clear that it's not a gift for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, pressuring people and like I I mean it it's bothered me. I I've, I love my charismatic brothers, but you know I've been to children's camps where they kind of yell in the kid's ear saying, say this, you practice, you're going to, this is Holy Spirit night, you're going to speak in tongues now. <laughs> you know, and so I've seen a lot of that. It drives me nuts, but, you know, bless their hearts. You know, it's just, I don't think it's biblical. <laughs> but, uh, so, anyways, but I don't think it's demonic if they mess up like that. I, I would differentiate from John MacArthur that out, way. Out of balance. Right? It's, out, it's out of balance, I'd say. So, yeah. But I think it's better to be a little out of balance and open to what the Spirit's doing than to run away from something Paul clearly said is, I don't, I don't think he said it would cease. Um, so, okay. Uh, do I have anything else? Let me see. Okay, so interpretation of tongues, I mentioned this already. Uh, so the supernatural ability to interpret a supernaturally given tongue. Now that's my definition. I think that's what the text is saying, but uh, I don't know if me and Derek have settled our differences on it. You can, again, talk to him, get his explanation. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> uh... So therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. If any speak in a tongue, let there be w only two or three, m two or at most three, in each in turn, and let someone interpret. Okay. And the reason I say I think they're both supernatural is that I don't see him switching subjects when he gets to that little passage there uh, from, like, a supernatural tongue to a foreign tongue. Um, it seems to be the same category. Um, so, anyways, it's my perspective. <clears throat> Let's see. Anything else here? Okay, so these. Okay, so summary of all of that. These gifts are given for the common good, which is why I think they're still for today, because the common good is still mm -hmm. valid. <laughs> um, it's not just for the apostolic authorities' establishment, as cessationists tend to say, because it's common it's an encouragement to the local body, not just the apostles. Common good died with the apostles. Yeah, <laughs> the common good died with the apostles. <laughs> so yeah, the common good, the building up of the body, are still valid today. Yes. Um, they should be practiced according to biblical guidelines, though. Okay, There are obviously lots of extremes today. I'd agree with a lot of the critiques cessationists make of the abuses that have gone on. 
Um, but again, uh, Sam Storms likes to say uh, the cure for improper use is not disuse, it's proper use. Okay. And uh, if anything, I'd actually, you know, I'll just close and say pray for a gift. If you have a desire for one of these, and you, it might be the Holy Spirit drawing you to one of them, pray that God would give it. <laughs> Paul said to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. That was a command. It's a good thing. I don't, I'd don't. i rather err on the side of a little, getting a little bit free than cautioning you out into being a functional cessationist, even though I doctrinally tell you you shouldn't be. Don't be so cautious that you know, you never function in a spiritual gift. You know, that's a good thing. So, <clears throat> all right. So, any closing thoughts before we close in prayer? No? Um, I wanted to say I have this one interesting book at home. It's a very old paperback book, and it, it's something about apples in the title. And I feel like it was written from a charismatic point of view, but it was kind of a documentation of all these different stories about missionaries, people who work in the faith, who had these supernatural things happen to them. So it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, and at times it seemed odd. I was like, I don't know if I like this, but if I step back and looked at what the miracle had done, it always seemed to bring glory to God. So it was something I could say, uh, you know, that I may not be familiar with this, it may not be, you know, something I can easily rationalize, but it did accomplish good. So it wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's what you're trying to say here is yeah. this is a good thing, even if it's may not be something that you're immediately familiar with. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, one of the teachings that we had experienced years ago looked at all the different areas of um, the listings of the gifts mm -hmm. and they are slightly different yeah. from one to another mm -hmm. and in the teaching it was explained that one listing basically um, the, one of the first references you gave mm -hmm. um, talked about oh dear uh -huh. um What was one of the first references that you gave? Let's see here. Um, first Corinthians. First Corinthians. When we were talking about what? Twelve. Were we talking about? Uh, were we talking about spiritual gifts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's First Corinthians twelve. It's okay, here it is. Okay, it's twelve. Yeah. Starting in verse four. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. And so in the teaching. Um, it was explained that the varieties of gifts was actually talking about gifts that relate to who you are, your personality, mm -hmm. and how you function. Yeah. And then, um, as, a, as an individual, I'm, I, I don't mean function in service to people, but mm -hmm. then the service was basically, and I know I'm not going to get this completely right because it's been a long time since I reviewed it, but... Um, I, I shouldn't say anything about that because I can't remember. Um, varieties of activities was individual actions that take place in a specific time. Uh -huh. And that any one of us may have a prophet personality, mm -hmm. but function as a teacher. Yeah. And maybe speak with a word of knowledge in a particular circumstance. Yeah. So that these gifts are partly who you are as a person, but partly who you, how you serve mm -hmm. in the body. Yeah. Do I, am I making sense you're making, to you? You're making sense. Yeah, it's interesting. Part of me, like, there's, there's, there's somebody just mentioned it today, spiritual gift tests. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I don't, yeah. know how I, I don't know how yeah. I feel about them, because it's like, in this it seems to be clearly a supernatural thing. Oh, it is. Yeah, but yeah. it's like almost sometimes counter to your personality. But then there's also, you are gifted differently. Like So I think the principle Paul's talking about of the variety of mm -hmm. gifts in unity, it can apply to talking about your personality and like mm -hmm. embracing every different every difference, you know, into one. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, it's weird. Sometimes I see people with prophetic personalities also being prophetic, like supernaturally. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes someone who's not quite 
that personality says something supernatural, you know. And that's and so where it's, it's, he was delineating yeah. where the varieties of gifts, now that's who you are, but you may not function in that aspect yeah. in the church. Mm-hmm. You may function another way, even though that is your personality. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, there's certain qualities, um, character qualities, mm-hmm. that seem to go with the different types of gifts. For is somebody's a mercy, somebody's a this or a that, or mm-hmm. you know, and and so their personality fits in with character qualities that are displayed. Yeah. So yeah. I'll have to get the information for you. Sure. Another thing that I had heard in the previous church that I was in was was basically that you you're given certain gifts. God gives you certain yes. gifts, but if a time comes, like if there was something you needed, He might give you a gift for that moment. Yes. To edify the body. Yes. To help you in whatever capacity. But that's not a gift that I now have all the time. It's just a gift that was placed on me for that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that, that's mm-hmm. exactly what He was pretty much saying. In that teaching that we had, I mean, right in the scripture, says God distributes these gifts as He wills, which I think implies that you know, to some it, some people kind of have a <laughs> gift where they're overall in general goodness area, but yeah. I think it also says you know, if God decides somebody needs a specific gift for this moment, He can Absolutely. do that as well. Because yeah. I mean, even if you think about it, we're imitators of Christ. Christ mm-hmm. had all the gifts in perfect balance, so mm-hmm. you know, although we're imperfect. Mm-hmm. There's at least the ability there. Yeah. As God sees fit. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Well, we are at, wow, one hour and 42 minutes session. Usually they're like an hour long. Awesome. So it's 8 o'clock. <laughs> Mr. Durkee, would you like to close us in prayer? Father, we thank you for this evening and uh, for Eric, the preparation he's put into these lessons. The most of all, Lord, we thank you for you who opens our hearts and our eyes and our minds to hear and understand. Pray now, Lord, as we go back to our homes and reflect on what we have learned tonight. It will be used for your glory. Keep us safe on the highways as we travel.